Hello, everyone. This is Rob Golfie with Remax, the Golfie team. Welcome to the Golfie Real Estate Show, Niagara Edition, with host Tim Dennis. We welcome another week, and uh, the real estate business has been hit with another few headlines over the past little while. So we're going to talk about some of that. Uh, we're going to get to Halloween because that's coming up in a couple of weeks, a little bit later on. Uh, so th- we've got a lot to discuss, uh, but let's start off with whether or not there are more homes coming on the market right now, because let's talk to the person who's out there looking around. Are there, are there more homes to be found, Rob? There's a lot of homes out there and the inventory is climbing and, and it's at record highs. So I've, I've, I've give, dr- given you a list of them. So just in like in uh, let's start with Niagara Falls, Niagara <laughs> Falls right now uh, with active listings is, um, where are we here? In uh, 2023, October, there's 514 homes active right now. And now last month, it was at 523. So it could climb still because we still got another few weeks uh, to go. And uh, But it's been the highest. Uh, I think it, that's the highest I've ever seen it. It's, it, I, I went back to 2019. We've never had that inventory. And that's why it, it, it is quiet out there. Sellers are frustrated, and they're wondering why their houses aren't selling, and it's just something they have to be patient. And, and if you're not under the pivotal point of what the market value is, and it's changing every, every week, that market value changes every week, so you've got to get underneath it. But at, in Niagara Falls, there's a... Uh, inventory level of uh, 514 right now will probably climb up to 550 by the end of the month. Um, and then when you go to St. Catharines, St. Catharines, in, it's about 545 right now. It's the same as a uh, little higher than uh, Niagara Falls. And the, the next best highest, I think it was July of 2019, we were at 469 in inventory um, where else was there? In July of 2022, when the market started cr- climbing down, you start seeing in the 400 range. But we are at an all-time high, all-time high there, especially in uh, in uh, uh, St. Catharines. Welland, uh, we're at 255. And usually the average is maybe 120, you know, that uh, 160. But it's, it's been floating around in all different numbers. But we're at, at 255 right now uh, in uh, active listings. And then Niagara on a lake, it's it's really getting pretty tough out there. They're at uh, 254 active listings, and for a long time, in all of 2021, there were like under 80 uh, active listings, uh, right up until the middle of uh, May of 2022. And then they started getting into the like 120, 140, 150, but we're at 254 active listings in Niagara and Lakes. So Niagara and Lakes is going to be a little bit of a tough sell. Um, you better price it right out there. And uh, be, otherwise, there is a lot of houses sitting on the market with a lot of, and there's a lot of days on market out there. And uh, it's 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 a what, crazy what market. For, what does that mean for the buyer? It means opportunity for the buyer. Now, it, coming up, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, dealing with the high interest rate is not a big deal. The key thing is in a year from now, the interest rates will come down within 18 months. So don't be afraid. It's going to be short-term pain for long-term gain. So you'll be able to negotiate a great deal now, and then you will benefit in, in, in a year to 18 months from now. I, I, I truly believe that, I'm, I, and I'm telling you, if you play this segment again in 18 months, you're going to say, Rob, you were right. Like, the opportunities are out there, and so... First-time buyers, do not be afraid. Like, it's coming. Your time is coming, and it's coming at the end of this year. Now, for the go- sellers, opportunities there. Now, if you're selling and buying at the same time, it balances out. But don't uh, sell uh, at the end of this year and then buy in the middle of next year. And, and you know, like, and then you're going to end up, you might buy a little higher. It just depends how the market goes. So, and we've seen a lot of people do that where they sell when it's low and, and, and buy when it's high. Don't do that. Try to buy in the same market. So a lot of people have, they're buying new builds, right? They want, they want to be comfortable. They say, hey, listen, I want to make sure my house is sold. My new build's not going to be ready till the end of next year. And they want to sell now. So, like, 
I, you, you set your price on the new build. I gotcha. You're thinking you want to sell it now because you're, you feel comfortable because you want to know it's going to be sold. Be careful at the end of the years. I always say, if you're going to sell at the end of the year, I would wait till February. I, and usually the market uh, spurs up in February and you will do better with your price on your house in February if you have the time. But if you don't, hey, it's, it is what it is and nothing you could do about it. That's just the way the market is. I mean, you still, if you owned your house more than 10 years, you're still way ahead. You're, or even five years, you're still way, way ahead of the situation. So, so you will be fine out there. Um, it's, it's, you know what, uh, Tim, it's, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of scary things are happening. A lot of people are getting their mortgages big, uh, uh bigger payments and, uh, but just hang in there. I, all I say is just hang in there. Let me throw you a, I was going to say a hypothetical situation, but it happens a lot. You have to buy and sell at the same time, right? Maybe it's a, a job move or whatever the case may be. You're looking to buy in a house, but you've got one and sell at the same time. Are, should you be worried? No, no, because the, you're, you're buying and selling in the same market. So people, here's, here's the one thing I don't understand how people get in their head. They go, I want to wait till the market gets up in price. Okay, but, but, they're, but they're still looking at moving to buy a house. So if you are waiting till your house goes up in price, okay, you're going to get a higher price for your house when you buy it. But when... You want to sell your, uh, sorry, you're going to get, you, you get the higher price. But when you want to buy, you're going to pay a higher price. It balances out. It just, I just don't get it. People don't understand. Like people say, I want 800000 for my house, but the house is only worth six, uh, 700000 So I'm going to wait till it hits 800000 Well, if they're looking at buying a house, it's going to be $100,000 more also. So it, it just balances out to whatever they're going to buy. So you buy in a low market, you buy and sell in a low market, you even out. It, that's how it works. All right, let's, okay, let's go to another hypothetical situation. And this is very hypothetical. I'm rich and I, I really want an expensive home in the area. Uh, where am I looking? What's, what's out there that's really pricey? People have a fascination with this. Yeah, you know what? There's opportunities out there. So here's, here's the thing. I was looking at one house that was in Niagara on a lake. It's listed at $10 million. Beautiful place. Indoor pool. Outdoor. Uh, it's about $10 million. $10,750. Wow. It's been on the market, uh, I think, for, for quite a while now. And I'm, they're just sitting on the market. There's not many people can afford a $10 million house. It, I mean, it's got to be somebody that, you know, that lives in the Niagara area, wants to live in the Niagara area, and wants to own a house like this. It's on one acre. And $10 million can buy you a lot. Like, for one thing, you can buy a prop property, tear down a house, build what you want, and, and get, you know, a $10 million house goes a long way. I'll tell you that. But this house has quite a bit. Now... They've been on the market. They know it takes time to find that buyer. And I always, do, I'm not a big fan of buying expensive uh, luxury homes as an investment. Because here's the one thing. Most people that buy these uh, expensive homes, especially over $3 million, they buy it and then they'll put about a half a million dollars into it. And you don't even notice it wherever they put the half a million. It could be in landscaping. It could be anywhere. Um, and it's just that they're just changing it the way they want. Five to eight years later, they may make a little more money on it, but it's not, it's not a, a significant amount of what they put into it to keep that house in order and, to, uh, and, and, and the return on investment. I'm going to tell you, I'd rather buy 10 properties valued, let's say uh, $5 million, than buy a $5 million house. And I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee you those five properties that I, I value, let's say it's a million dollar property, in, in five to 10 years, I will make more money on those $5 million properties, that five $1 million properties versus the, the one property that's worth $5 million by itself. It won't go up as, as value. So if you have, if, if, and, I, and that's what luxury is about. You don't care if you're, you're going to make money or not, but they do when they sell. But you, you just say, hey, this is my place where I'm going to live. I'm going to love it here. I don't care. I'm going to put uh, whatever. I'm going to have butterfly uh, uh, cage here. I'm going to do a lion's <laughs> den there and all that kind of stuff. They, they will do whatever because they're doing it because they can afford to do it. But when they want to sell, they get upset 
with you because n- nobody wants that house. Nobody, because it was specially made for that person uh, of what he has. But so right now we've got about 34 homes in Niagara, the, most of them in Niagara and the Lake, uh, that are over $3 million. And uh, it's, uh, it, you know, you got one on concession here in Niagara and the Lake, uh, 8.99 8. Uh, million. And then the, then the next one drops to 7.8 million. So these houses, there's room for negotiations. And they, and they put the price up because they know people are going to negotiate. Just like the one I sold for $3.6 million, there was room for negotiations. We put room in that listing price for negotiations because we know high-end people want to negotiate. And, and we were trying to figure out the percentage. Was it 7%? And I think it was the average, sometimes 5 to 7% negotiation room when it comes to higher end properties. So, right. so that's something you got to look at when you list a high end property because that's what the buyer is looking for. But the opportunities right now, uh, if you want to get a beautiful house, you can go in and negotiate something half decent. And, and again, you, 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 if you can afford it, can afford the mortgage, get in, in about uh, a year to 18 months from now, you will, that mortgage payment will be a lot less because the interest rates will come down to somewhere around four and a half percent, five percent. And if you can afford that, then you're good to go. Right now, people are getting six uh, mortgages at six and a half percent. I think it's, it's around that range, but it's, it's opportunities are out there right now. 34, 34 Niagara uh, listings that are in there. Some of them are really gorgeous properties that are for sale. So that, that $10 million one is the is the most expensive in Niagara right now? That, the $10 million one, yeah. It's on yeah. Gage Street in uh, in Niagara. I, I looked at the pictures. Beautiful. I'm like, I, I like to move into those. But you know what the scary thing about buying these um, expensive homes? I mean, anything you do, like you need expensive furniture you need if you have to update it's expensive update your kitchen alone is probably got to uh, it, it'll cost probably you know three to five hundred thousand dollars just to update like like you can't go in and cheap out on anything you have to buy top quality first quality stuff to do anything for updates or anything just to put a new shingles on a on a roof like that if it does have shingles maybe it's got uh, a slate roof or a steel roof it could cost you 250 to 300 thousand dollars i mean that's like just okay i gotta need i need new shingles you know how we hate paying for shingles because yep. shingles doesn't you know people don't come to your house hey beautiful shingles you got yeah. nobody comes to your house and says that so but that's what it the cost of running an expensive house so you got to make sure that you can afford uh, an expensive. I have I have a a, a large ten thousand square foot office that are, is our main office, and it's not cheap. It's expensive. Like I've got a clay roof. I had to find a guy that can handle clay roof, and it took us a while to find it. You know, because we had a little leak in some spot, and I was thinking of ripping out all the clay and then putting a new roof. They wanted a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm like, ikes. You know what I mean? Like what? Yep. Yeah. Like it's. You know, I don't, I don't make the money like you do, Tim. Like, what's, you know what I mean? I can't. Oh, uh... no, no one does, Rob. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Here. You yeah. know what? You know what was interesting in this list of all these expensive homes is I expected them all to be Niagara-on-the-Lake, Fond Hill, but they're all over the place. I'm seeing St. Catharines, Fond Hill, uh, Fort Erie, Port Colborne, Wayne Fleet. They're all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and just to let you know, there was only 10 of them that sold – in in the in the last uh, six months, so thirty. So what would you say? A third of them would, are selling. So thirty percent of the homes are selling the high end homes. So like only ten over three million dollars sold in the last six months, which is tough. And out of them, there was only one in Grimsby. That's the one I had. There was three in Niagara and Lake, two in St. Catharines, and no, there was two in, in Grimsby. Three, three in Niagara Lake, two in St. Catharines, one in Fort Erie, and one in Lincoln. So it, it's not easy. It's not easy. These high-end homes, like I usually sign a year contract when I list one of them. And, and if, if the homeowner is not, you know, reasonable with that, like if he wants a certain high number, because you, 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 you may need that time. It's not because uh, th- 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 there's, you can't sell it. It's just because there's not many buyers in that price yeah. point. Gotcha. When we come back, we're heading into that time of the year where uh, homes are decorated a lot. There's Halloween, then there's Christmas after that, et cetera, et cetera. Is that something you need to worry about if you're selling your home? Uh, Rob's got some advice, uh, some observations on that, and so much more 
When we come back on the Golfy Real Estate Show. You've got the Golfy Real Estate Show. His name is Rob Golfy. The Golfy Real Estate Show is named after him because he's the head of the Remax Golfy team. I'm Tim Dennis, and uh, we're talking about things uh, that help sell your house, might get in the way of selling your house. How about something I love to do every Halloween, which is decorate my home? Now, luckily, I'm not trying to sell my home. Uh, are there some rules to live by here if you are somebody who loves putting out skeletons and decorating for Halloween, Rob? It, it is. You know what? If you're thinking about selling your house, sometimes, I mean, everybody loves this time of the year. Uh, most people do. They love decorating it, giving it uh, you know, a little haunted look of their house inside and out. And if you're thinking of selling, you may have to skip it, <laughs> you know, especially if you're going outside putting all this uh, scary stuff out. Because, and we just, I just went to one. And uh, they had a lot of decorations outside and inside. And I was telling them, hey, guys, listen, we're going to bring our photographers in. Like, is there any way you can put, put the Halloween stuff away for the photographs? I don't mind if right. it comes back out, you know, during the showings. I'm cool with that. But it's just that these pictures, we don't know how long the house is going to take, it, and especially now with the market, the way it's going, and, and, and the amount of inventory that's out there. So, and, 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 and you're trying to be gentle with people and saying, you know, is there any way we can hide that stuff for the photographs? It, I don't mind if it comes back out after, but, uh, but minimize it. Do not put too much of it. Let, less is more. Keep it tasteful. If you go too crazy, then, you know, people are, are, are more focused on your decorations than they are on your house. Uh, curb appeal, like, make it, you got to make your curb appeal look uh, awesome. Like, you know, a couple of curved pumpkin, pumpkins is okay, you know, with, you know, nice welcome touch. Uh, neutral and inclusive decor, of, you know, avoid any decor that might be considered offensive. Sometimes there's some offensive stuff out there. People are like, you know what, I, I come through the house and, you know, I, I kind of didn't like what they had there. Yeah. Clutter and clutter, eliminate clutter. A lot of people have a lot of stuff on their, uh, you know, shelvings and, and, and tables and end tables and stuff. R remove as much as you can. Minimize that. That's the key thing. Uh, timing, like, you know, like consider the time, like Halloween is, you know, is coming up, decorating your home a few days before the holidays and removing the decorations shortly after is a way to go, you know, uh, buyer preference. Keep in mind that buyers celebrate Halloween, but some might not uh, appreciate that. So be careful. So again, like I said, um, you know, try not to have any, uh, decorations in the house, especially at Christmas time. It's hard. Some people put their house up for sale at Christmas. Uh, we photograph, it's got the Christmas tree, but we re-photograph that room in the new year. Boom. We just, we want to make sure that uh, it, it, the listing doesn't look stale with Christmas pictures. You don't want a house that's still for sale in, in uh, May or June that has Christmas yeah. pictures in there. So you yep. definitely want to reshoot the, reshoot the house. But I mean, it's, it's fun and it's everything, but remember... Our, our job is to get you the top dollar, what everybody wants, and we want to focus on the house, not on the decorations. And uh, but yeah, so be be uh, mindful on on uh, when you're putting up your house for sale. And we're putting a lot up for sale right now, and a lot of people are just skipping the decorations, or if they are, they're doing minimal amount. Somebody sent me a picture the other day of a home that was for sale that had all kinds of snow around it. There was obviously a big snowfall, and then they took pictures, and I thought, wow, those pictures are old. Um, is, is that something to watch, too? you got to keep your photography up if you're, if you're going to attract people? Absolutely. We, uh, in early spring, when we feel that the snow is going to be gone for good, uh, we have our photographers. we got three of them. We have them go out and reshoot the exteriors of all the houses that have snow. We reshoot them, and sometimes it, we just may have that one or two day snowfall, and it, the snow lasts for about three, four days, and and it melts. And yep. sometimes we have to take pictures because they we got to get the house on the market, and it has snow. We'll go back a week later and reshoot that, uh, take the take the snow pictures out. Just you know, and it's just part of our job to make sure that your house looks at its best uh, when we're uh, marketing it out there. And, and and you know what, the like if you see a house coming off the market. And it's still listed. It, let's say in June, it's got snow pictures. That that realtor is not doing you any justice. Get rid of him. Like if you go on Realtor.ca, and you see a house with snow pictures on it, um, you know you should you should call the realtor and say, listen, I, I think it's time for me to change to somebody else because most good realtors will 
reshoot and change the photographs, no matter how long that listing is. They should do that. Let me uh, let me talk about something else that is popular these days. People are talking about townhouses a lot, but um, if you're looking at a townhouse and you want to put some money down, it seems that your down payment is going to be a little bit more than it used to be. What's driving this? Yeah, it's just the market, especially especially in Ontario. Like, it, it, and and they're talking about. Um, how the down payment is. So, for instance, uh, the study indicated that the average down payment for a townhouse was $18,295 in 2018, okay? And, but, at, but at that time, the actual average price was 365900 Now, fast forward five years to 2023, the landscape has changed considerably despite recent dips in the market. Now, the average average 2023 down payment for a townhouse is $36,610, slightly more than double of the 2018. Now, by comparison, the town uh, in in Regina, uh, nearly identical to the same figure in 2018, the down payment was 11,170 then then versus now 11,465 so in regina things haven't really changed much now it's it's it, it's gotten more expensive and not only that it's the land transfer tax at the same time when you close the deal to to buy the house now for instance i got here and i sent them to you so for instance in uh, right now in niagara falls a townhouse uh, average sale price is 634000 okay? Now, if we go back 10 years, the average price of a townhouse in 2013 in Niagara Falls was 221000 Yep. Not a bad gig, eh? Can you imagine if you bought 10 of those? Um, so, I mean, they've, they've almost tripled in price, but, but, but what they're saying in 2018... The average sale price in Niagara Falls for a townhouse was three hundred, let's say three hundred and fifty thousand. So it's it's still almost du- it's almost doubled in uh, Niagara Falls, in in St. Catharines in two thousand eighteen three hundred and sixty two, let's say three hundred sixty three thousand, and the average sale price now uh, that's up in uh, St. Catharines six hundred and eighteen thousand six hundred. Um, and it's, it's showing, and what, let's look at Welland. Welland in 2018, 291,500 right now in Welland's it's 643,000. So it's doubled and it's, it's crazy that that's since 2018. And so the down payment's gone up quite a bit. And now if we hit over the million dollar mark, that becomes even more crazy. So we're going we're gonna to come to a time, and it's going to be in te- less than 10 years from now, where the average price is going to be maybe 10, uh, um, um, over a million or a million. They're yeah. already there in the big cities. They, though, oh, right? they like, are. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but once you hit the $1 million mark, like if you go like $1 million or $1 million one, your down payment is significantly higher than it is at nine hundred and ninety nine 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 nine, and just just that one dollar under, you, uh, it's a lot lower. So you have to be careful now when you buy. So hopefully they change the rules and say, hey, we know the average sale price is is over a million. We're going to change the rules, but they don't do that. You know, it's it, it's it's like this. Tell me if you remember this, Tim. I remember many many years ago. If you spend four dollars or less on a lunch. There's no taxes. Right. Okay. I remember it. Yep. That still stands today. Now, that's been effective since the 70s, but that's they the haven't increased that. My, that's the cost of my coffee now. I know, but they haven't increased that. Cost of living's gone up. So back then, they say, hey, if you're going to sp- buy lunch, you know, if you're spending less than $4, you don't pay no tax on it. But but how many years have gone by? And, and the government, I mean, I mean, it's a small thing, but I'm just saying they should have changed it. Hey, lunch should be maybe $10. If you spend more than $10, you pay tax on it. If you spend $10 or less, there's no tax. So, but they haven't changed that. And nobody's complained about that because, I don't know, millennials don't care, I guess, and, and baby right. boomers don't care. I don't know. But, but somebody should look into that, and I think that's something that uh, uh, somebody should uh, – Go go to uh, go to Ottawa and say, hey, let's wake up and let's give the same uh, same discounts that we got when we got in the seventies. But the same houses used to be the entry level 
for a lot of people, right? It is. I yeah, and a lot of people felt that back in the day, like in the seventies, all townhouses were like kind of slums. Uh, you live in a townhouse; it's a cheap, cheap way of you know, like they just you're kind of looked at differently living in a townhouse. But now townhouses don't have that anymore. Hey, you live in like townhouses are like a regular residential, single family detached or whatever. Um, but yeah, like they've been around for, for a long time. I mean, townhouses, I think were started in, in Europe. I mean, like, you know, but they just didn't have much land, I guess, over there. You know, it's, it's funny because people looked at townhouses in, I don't know, St. Catharines, Niagara Falls, differently than they would look at a townhouse in a big city because you think of a townhouse in a big city you're thinking though those brown stones everybody thinks oh they're fabulous but then years ago when you got to a smaller city it's oh it's just a townhouse it's just you know an entry level thing but that's that's completely a different mindset it, it is it is and you're absolutely right just like you said the brown stones people wanted to live in them in the big cities but when you go in the rural areas yep. like the the smaller towns and in areas people like you know the townhouse was kind of like uh more for a lower income uh family yep. at that time but now it, it that's totally changed the landscape which i like you know what i mean anybody can live in a townhouse and which is fantastic, but it's amazing how much they've gone up in price. Just it's insane. So what is um, a, an entry level house now? I mean, if you're a young couple, a single person trying to stick your toe into the market, what are you looking at? Are you looking at, you know, very tiny, single detached homes? What? How can you get into the market? What are you looking at? It's tough. You're buying sometimes a house that was built in the 50s and 60s that's probably dated, and you slowly update it yourself as you're living there. And, and they're probably going between six and seven hundred thousand. And um, it and it's and it's becoming tough for a lot of first time buyers. And what the government's doing is they're trying to expand uh, the inner city um, inner city of uh, populating that more, and a lot of people don't want to live in a, in a condo apartment. Some people just want a, a, a detached or a townhouse. And, um, and, but what they're doing is they're slowing down the green belt. And I understand they're trying to save, trying to save the green land. But what they're doing is they're making the townhouses, single family detached homes, way more expensive. In, in, in t 10 to 20 years from now, there's going to be such a huge demand for that that they're going to go up in price so much because they're, they're focusing on the inner city of uh, expanding the inner city uh, with the condos. And so, like, every time they stop one thing, it, in 10 years, they affect another thing. And, and I truly believe that townhouses, single-family detached homes – with the shortage of homes on the market, with the population coming into this country, uh, with the immigration, I, I truly feel that like like these properties are going to be worth well over a million dollars in, in less than 10 years. Wow. I mean, just the numbers you just talked about have to scare a lot of young people who are thinking of it, yet uh, you, there are very few investments that you can make where the kind of return is possible. I mean, even now, right? You're ta you just talked about townhouses going up by double in 10 years. And a lot of investments you can do that with, right? Oh, no, there isn't. And I'll tell you, when I, first started, when I bought my first house when I was 20 years old, the opportunities, I think, were easier for, for me back then than it is for a 20-year-old today. Um, I truly believe that uh, the amount of income people were making and the amount of uh, and, and, and what house prices were, it it worked. It worked. But the way people's incomes are today versus house prices, it's tough. It's it's tough to get going. And you really got to work hard at it and and save and scrimp and borrow and beg uh, to get to own a house now. We have to pause for a moment and then we're going to get back to uh, what what are some of the answers to these questions from a from a a realtor and an expert like rob what what are some of the affordable housing strategies that might work in this country when we come back on the golfy real estate show 
Tim Dennis here, but it's the Golfy Real Estate Show with Rob Golfy of Remax the Golfy Team. And you know that if you've got questions about real estate, this is the show to get to. You can find it right here every week, or you can look up previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts on Google Podcasts or Spotify or iTunes or whatnot. And it's very simple. Just look for the Golfy Real Estate Show and all the previous episodes will pop up uh, wherever you happen to listen. Now, we've been talking about real estate a lot in the past few weeks and months about strategies that can get by the, the challenges that we're facing right now. There are people who have come up with some affordable housing strategies that are actually showing some signs of working. Rob, talk to me about some of these. Where are they? Yeah, so in in uh, uh, Westminster, B.C., uh, they passed an anti-renoviction bylaw that fined landlords up to $1,000 a day. Now, to comply, landlords had to both demonstrate, demonstrate it was necessary uh, for the tenant to uh, vacate their unit uh, for renovation work and provide tenants with a written offer to return at the same time. Now, before they implemented this renoviction uh, bylaw, 300 rent evictions uh, in the three years prior uh, were, were implemented. When they implemented this bylaw, nothing has happened. There's no rent evictions. So, people, so landlords are not pushing uh, tenants out to uh, renovate and have their tenants move out. So what, 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 landlord, what landlords were doing saying, hey, I got to renovate your unit, so you're going to have to find someplace else to live, and when I'm done, you have the chance to come back. A lot of times they never came back. So now landlords are probably not renovating as much. They're just probably doing, you know, the basic stuff, paint and, and fix up what they have to do. So that's what uh, uh, new uh, Westminster uh, BC is doing. Now in Burnaby, uh, tenants uh, with the assisted, uh, assistance policy, Burnaby just outside Vancouver has taken action against both renovations and demovictions and arguably has the best tenant protection policies. Now, there are four key elements into the tenant assistance policy. The right to return to a similar unit at a roughly the same rent when the work is finished. Now, the developer or landlord is obliged to help tenants find interim housing if needed. The rezoning applicant must pay a top-up fee to cover additional rental costs tenants incur. So if they move out, guess what? That landlord's got to pay the difference uh, if they, if it's a lot more than what it is now, the, and finance, and, and then their interim housing and then financial assistance to tenants to cover moving costs. Now, Burnaby rules are far more prescribed and detailed than any other, uh, in Canada. And they place the onus on the responsibility firmly on the landlord to ensure tenants can return. So this is not a case. This is not the case in Ontario where tenants also have the right to return, but few are able to do so. So in Montreal, in 2016, the city of Montreal has given the preemptive right to acquire property that is identified, identified 350 properties to be exact, where it can exercise this right. Now, this is pretty crazy. Generally, these are low rent buildings in uh, gentrifying neighborhoods. Now, in one of these properties is sold on the open market, the city has 60 days to match that offer and buy the site for the same price agreed by the private buyer. So basically, you it, it, and they designated 350 properties in Montreal. Now, if, if the owner sells this to a buyer, that buyer buys it, he still doesn't have, he still may not get it. So he may end up having to forfeit it and sell it to the uh, to the to the city, so they can uh, put that as low income housing. Pretty cra- pretty crazy uh, what what Montreal is doing. So and they allocated ten million dollars a year to do that. So and uh, and then in Ontario, um, you know, they uh, we have the rent control basically uh, and. Um, in, in, in Ontario where you, you're only allowed so much, they're, they're holding people accountable now. Now, prior to COVID, prior to COVID, a lot of people were forced to move out. They, you know, renovations, whatever. Um, um, tenants did not get any compensation whatsoever. After COVID, you know, cost of living went up, uh, housing went up, um, rental uh, apartments went up. 
So there was a lot of backlash. So now a lot of uh, tenants are saying, hey, you want me out? I want five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. But myself as a tenant, and, I, and, I, and, and I, don't, I know landlords don't want to hear this, I don't think I would take that money because it's going to be hard to find another place. And that $10,000 get eaten up pretty quick on the next place they move into. And what happens to a lot of tenants? They end up burning that money even before. You know, they have this newfound money, $10,000. They're going to end up burning it in, in less than two months, and then all of a sudden now they're paying high rent, and they don't have that compensation that they use, they got from the previous landlord to help pay for the uh, for the rent for the next uh, future. Um, Ontario also has that they they brought in to increase um, uh, apartments is that anything that's built after two thousand eighteen. Uh, there is no rent control. So that's why now we're starting to see a lot of apartment buildings going up. And that means anything, whether it's a, 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 a detached home, a condo, anything built after November 2018, there's no rent control on, on any of those uh, properties. And, uh, but um, rent evictions, they are happening, but it's not going to be as much as it was before. Like there was a building... Uh, in uh, Hamilton that sold for $50 million. I think they had, I'm not sure how many uh, units in there, 250 units. And the people, it was a, a, a real estate investment uh, company. They, put, they bought it for $50 million, put $5 million into it. And uh, so they must have, got, uh, they renovated it. They must have got rid of quite a few tenants in there. And uh, they put new tenants with the higher rents. And it got appraised at over $80 million. So there was a probably about $30, $35 million uh, increase in value that they made just because of the rental income. And, and these apartment buildings are based on rental income. How much rental income uh, does it have? And, and that's how it's based on, on, on what the value of the property is. So, like, it's... All, uh, of, these, all of these strategies um, sound... <laughs> They sound good from a from a tenant's point of view. I wonder on the other side of the coin, you know, we're talking about New Westminster and Burnaby, um, you know, and there's no rent evictions or demo evictions. And if uh, if they are doing work, they the landlord has to help you find housing. And I mean, how are how are the landlords reacting to these things? Well, it, 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 it's 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 tough. You're not going to see them buying as many as investment properties. Uh, yeah. um, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. So. I have, I, I have a property that had a, a fire about a year ago. It took about a year uh, to fix. So um, the house was ready for someone to move in within the last, like, six months ago. I wasn't sure if I was going to keep it or I was going to sell it. But I said, you know what? I'm going to make my decision within six months whether I'm going to keep it and sell it. I didn't rent it out because I didn't want to have the, the, the hassles of – if I rented it to somebody and I would have said to them, listen, I'm thinking of selling this, this place in six months. So if you're okay with the six month tenancy, um, then I have no problem. But then, but then they could give me a hard time uh, leaving and then I'm stuck uh, not be able to sell this place. So I literally had to keep the place empty for six months, be, not knowing what I wanted to do with this place. And I had people say, hey, are you going to rent it? I says, yeah, I'll let you know when I'm, when I'm ready to rent it. And so I, did, I just put it up for sale uh, th this week. Uh, now I am selling it. I didn't have to go through any, you know, telling the tenant I need to get people through. I didn't have to tell anybody that. So, so what they're doing, like, because it's becoming difficult and the landlord-tenant boards are taking forever for them to, to go to uh, arbitration, people, you're going you're gonna to see... People like me saying, well, you know what? I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I think I'm just going to keep it empty because it's cheaper for me to keep it empty than paying $10,000 to a tenant that he may not even take to leave. And then I have to wait nine months for, for it to go to the landlord-tenant board. So they're not making it easy for landlords, and, and, and they're, they're, going to make it, they're going to make it tougher, and landlords aren't liking this at all. Like I, I've got two other, like a few other properties with um, single-family homes with tenants in it, and I, it's not on the radar for me to sell it, and, but when they move out, if they, if they move out, um, I may consider selling them and buying something else, and, uh, and that's, that's what's happening. Like, like a lot of great landlords out there, the old 
you know, mom, pa, landlord, right? They had a tenant. They paid their rent on time. They never raised their rent. Never. Mm -hmm. Never. Because they paid on time. But then after when they want to sell it 25 years later, now the tenants give them a hard time. Just say, hey, listen, I never raised your rent for 30 years or 25 years. Now I want to sell it. Now you're, now you're giving, like, we, we had a great relationship. Now all of a sudden, terrible. It's terrible. You know, so they're, and, and these people are paying from probably $700 a month for a single family home. And now you can get probably $2,200 a month for the same house. Here in Canada, um, on the West Coast, in Toronto, Montreal, recently, we had, issues with foreign ownership of some places people were buying up homes from overseas and letting them sit and so the government was trying to address uh foreign ownership and they were changing the rules the tax structure and whatnot in florida they did something a, a whole lot different and a whole lot more controversial as they passed sb 264 which aimed primarily at chinese buyers and prevented them from buying property there uh, and basically led a lot of people to say it was discriminatory. Um, have you been following this story? Because it's affected the real estate market a lot in Florida, right? I, 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 I just started he hearing about this in Florida and I can't believe it. And uh, there, uh, I don't know what the Chinese population is. I don't know if it's like Van like our Vancouver here in Canada. Um, honestly, I don't know. I don't know if, if this will be able to be, if they can continue doing this. But I know that the government's trying to do everything to slow the uh, uh, inflation, slow real estate values uh, climbing rapidly. When Chinese people are, are negotiating or competing against each other, that's driving the price up, just like they did in Vancouver. And so now it looks like uh, Ron DeSantis, the, uh, I think the governor of uh, Florida, is yeah. trying to do something. Well, in, well, just like you said earlier, in Canada, now we, we as realtors here in Ontario, we have to be careful in how we like, talk to, like, if, uh, to buyers. Uh, we have a clause that says the buyer represents and warrants that the buyer is not and on completion will not be uh, will not be a non Canadian under the non Canadian provisions of the pro the pro prohibition on the purchase residential property of non Canadian uh, non Canadian which represents and and the warranty shall survive. So basically, I, the guy could tell me, "Hey, I, I, I'm a Canadian. We got his driver's license." It's not asking me for his Canadian citizenship card on um, FinTrack. And I can get fined by selling a house, which this guy can tell me that he is. And I don't, I mean, what do I know? Everybody has a driver's license, right? Yeah. And like, so now they're asking us to be the private eye and an investigator, you know, like it's just, it's just gone. It's just gone have insane. Rules, have the Canadian rules cooled the the foreign ownership they did they did market. okay yeah but we put this now we have this as a schedule b on every every single one of our offers just to protect ourselves so that in case they, there's something in there that we missed we they've signed this saying that they're if they're a non-canadian they uh they, they are saying they are a canadian citizen if you want your home sold uh you can talk to the remax team they're the number one remax team in canada you can call them at 905-641-0308 or go online at robgolfie.com. If you've got a question you'd like Ron, Ron, if you'd like Rob to ask uh, on next week's program, we we're talking about Ron DeSantis and suddenly I'm calling you Ron. Um, where can people ask a question, Mr. Golfie? Yeah, they can send us questions at uh, questions at golfieteam.com or they can go to Ro or just send Rob Golfie uh, at, at uh uh, golfyteam.com anywhere there it's easy to find us just google golfy and you will find us all over the internet uh, love to hear any questions that you may have for us excellent and you'll also find us right here back again same time next week 